Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Pan Future Society podcast. Today is Saturday, April 8th, 2017. This is episode number 44. So a rare event happened yesterday evening. The power went out at my house uh, for about 45 minutes. And it was a very strange uh, to... I, you know, I can't remember the last time I, I was somewhere where the power went out for a while. And it, not that I didn't have anything to do. I've got plenty of guitars to play and books to read and stuff like that. But it was a little strange how often I looked at the clock, which was not on. You know, the clock on the microwave was not on. Or how, how many light switches I tried to turn on without even thinking about it and not really realizing or not consciously aware of uh, all the things that were run on electricity in the house. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Go 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 outside to your house or, or your apartment building, you know. Who cares what the neighbors think or your uh, all the other people in your apartment building think. You know, go just turn off the mains for a while and, and see uh, see what everybody does. Anyway, uh, on with the news of the moment. The first item uh, on the news agenda this week, Japanese scientists want to be the first to drill into the Earth's mantle. The Earth's mantle is the layer of uh, our planet that is below the crust, uh, and we've never drilled down into it. There are some rocks that have been found that are believed to have come from the mantle. Uh, There's a rock called a Parodotite. It's kind of a yellowish green color, uh, and it's unlike other rocks that we find uh, around, and unlike volcanic rocks as well. And uh, the mantle is the molten interior part of the planet, and this Japanese team would use a drilling ship uh, to drop down through about four kilometers of ocean, six kilometers of the ocean floor, uh, which is part of Earth's crust, to reach into the mantle itself. They have several uh, sites that they're surveying to see where they would like to do this, one near Hawaii, one near Costa Rica, and one off the coast of Mexico. Um, they plan to do this, uh, they want to start by 2030, so there's still some, uh, research and development to be done before they can just go out and do this. Their goals for this research are, uh, one, just to get to the mantle, uh, also to investigate the boundary between the crust and the mantle, and, uh, try to learn a little bit more about how the crust itself is formed and also find out how deep microbial life might exist in the planet to see if they find any in, I would imagine, in the crust as they drill through. Uh, I can't imagine there being any in the mantle itself, but uh, it will be very interesting to know uh, for all the time we spend gazing at the stars uh, in many ways, uh, the deep ocean and certainly uh, beneath the crust of the earth, we know very little about it. And now, it came from outer space. Space, 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 space. For the first time, scientists have detected an atmosphere around an Earth-like planet outside our own solar system. The exoplanet GJ1132b, orbiting the dwarf star GJ1132, is about 39 light years away. This planet has a radius 1.4 times the size of Earth and is 1.6 times our mass. Uh, According to researchers, this planet is very much uh, likely to be Venus-like, with a very high surface temperature and a thick atmosphere, which may have made it easier to detect uh, the atmosphere in this case. This isn't the first time we've seen atmosphere of some kind, but it is the first uh, around an Earth-like world. 
John Southworth, a researcher at Keele University in the UK and lead author on uh, the new paper, uh, says, while this is not the detection of life on another planet, it is an important step in the right direction. The detection of an atmosphere around the super-Earth GJ1132b marks the first time that an atmosphere has been detected around an Earth-like planet other than Earth itself. Uh, scientists are trying to detect atmospheres around planets because in doing so you can do a light spectroscopy scan uh, and in the breaking out the different colors of light that you get you can tell what chemical composition you're looking at and they are primarily looking for oxygen uh, our own planet did not have enough oxygen to support life as we know it until a certain type of bacteria developed which started uh, basically breathing oxygen into the atmosphere. So uh, searching for at, uh, atmospheres around these exoplanets uh, not only is pushing the technology for their detection to higher and higher levels uh, to not only see the planet but to be able to sort out its atmosphere at that distance is incredible. But also in the potential detection of life, uh, you'd be looking for certain types of chemical footprints. And that is your news of the moment. On the main segment this week, we go back to a topic close to my heart and my actual expertise, musical instruments. In many ways, some instruments have remained unchanged for centuries, but with changes small and large, they are always evolving, both with new manufacturing techniques, materials, and computer-aided design, and with new combinations of sound and new ways of making music. In the 1960s, the Ovation Guitar Company developed Lyricord, a fiberglass compound that they used to make rounded guitar backs. They were trying to break the mold of how guitars had been made for a hundred years, and they were quite popular with some players, uh, but they also had their own unique sound, and so it wasn't something that would replace traditional wood entirely. Later, Ovation also started using carbon fiber in their guitar tops. Rainsong Guitars, founded in the 1990s, uh, makes guitars entirely out of carbon fiber. This eliminates warping, cracking, glue loosening, and other weather and humidity related problems with wood instruments. I got to play one in the late 1990s, and I thought it was great. Uh, they are very expensive, though, and their sound, while great by objective standards, isn't for everyone's unique taste in guitar tone. A few other manufacturers have also adopted carbon fiber into guitar necks, fretboards, bodies, and other instruments like the violin and cello. Less common, but still being developed, are wind and brass instruments like a carbon fiber trumpet and penny whistles. There's actually, I discovered a company right here in Oregon, up in Corvallis, that makes carbon fiber uh, Celtic instruments like penny whistles and pipes and chanters and things like that. Uh, very interesting. There aren't a lot of uh, wind instruments and brass instruments being made from materials like this yet. I suspect it's probably mostly a tone issue. Being trying to replicate a good tone is probably a little harder in this case. Uh, but it's very interesting to see this development carrying out to just about every kind of instrument there is. And like it has in so many other areas of manufacturing, 3D printing is changing instrument building. In one part, 3D printers are being used by builders, large and small, to manufacture parts for their instruments. There are also whole instruments being made with 3D printing, everything from guitars to recorders to saxophones. 
Some are not actually very good instruments, uh, more of a proof of concept that you could do it, uh, but some are also quite excellent. There are makers who are trying to replicate traditional sounds shaped with new materials, uh, like one violin maker I found, uh, uh, the video of it played sounded like a wonderful wooden violin. Others are creating new kinds of instruments that make sounds in ways never heard before. Among some of these are instruments that are great and unique pieces of art also. While traditional wood instruments are often works of art in their own right, 3D printing with synthetic materials opens a whole new world of shapes and designs. A company called Monad, which is also an architecture company, has built things from guitar-like instruments to alien-looking violins, droning wind pipes, and sound-producing art installations. I'll have a link to them in the notes. It's beautiful work, though many of you might find the music produced a little avant-garde for your tastes. YouTube has quite a few videos of various 3D printed instruments being played, so you can get a sense of the range of what's being made now. I wonder if in the future 3D printing will evolve to the point where almost everything is on demand. Need a flute? Print it, play it, recycle it until you need to print it again. Even large instruments like the piano are changing. Carbon fiber, 3D printing, and other new building techniques are changing piano designs and sound. I'll have uh, a few links in the notes to videos of some high-tech pianos. It really is remarkable to see changes in an instrument that has been so familiar for nearly 300 years. And yet, everything old is new again. About 20 years ago, I started seeing spalted maple used in guitars. Spalted wood is discolored by fungus, usually after the tree dies, but sometimes before. At one time, spalting was considered a defect and undesirable, at least by mass instrument makers. However, other instrument makers and woodworkers of all types decided the unique patterns of color and defect were worth working with and have used the spalting for its artistic look. Every spalted pattern is different. For a time, uh, there was great concern also over what woods were available for guitar building. Though guitars use little wood compared to other industries like furniture making, Many luthiers use rare and endangered wood like rosewood. Other more common woods like walnut and pine were thought less usable, but no more. There has been an explosion in use of a wider variety of woods, often prizing them for their complex grain patterns. And wood, properly managed, is an endlessly renewable resource. However, wood has not been properly managed to date, and some types are banned from international sale, like Brazilian rosewood. Builders have relied on old stock stashed away prior to 1992, but some new techniques are allowing the use of other woods in places where rare woods were once used. Roasting, or thermal modification, uses heat to alter the color and hardness of the wood. The color is secondary, but changing the hardness of a wood, uh, it will vibrate better and produce a better sound. Kiln drying of wood has been around for ages, but it takes a long time, and wood often is best left to season for years. Modern roasting processes speed this up greatly and can be applied to more sustainable and available wood to change their characteristics to more closely match uh, some of the more traditional woods that are unavailable. A German luthier has also developed a process where pine is boiled and then pressed very tightly, down to 60% of its previous volume. This ends up making the pine much stronger and harder and more dense, and he uses it for fretboard wood, and it even looks like rosewood, which is one of the most popular fretboard woods. Moving on to other new sounds, 
Musicians have always experimented and sought new ways of making sounds. Whether banging on pots and pans or developing wild new guitar effects, people who create with sound are natural explorers. One of the more recent devices that has intrigued me is the ACPAD, A-C-P-A-D. It's a flat, wireless MIDI controller that mounts to the front of your acoustic guitar. It has a number of buttons, sliders, and pads you can use to control synthesizers and other sounds via MIDI, which is a musical instrument digital interface. And I think this is an interesting merger of old traditional sound with new high-tech possibilities. While the theremin has been around for a long time, computers, smartphones, and other new tech are creating new ways to make music with motion control. You just move your hands or even your whole body around to alter sounds. And I imagine that virtual reality will soon play a role in this. What would it be like to play some futuristic instrument from the inside? Put on your VR goggles and suits and move within the instrument. Interact in the whole 360-degree sphere to shape the sound. And I can't let this segment go without mentioning a longtime acquaintance of mine, Jim Bartz, and his invention, the String Station. I'll link to it in the notes. You really need to see it to believe it. The String Station is a 40-stringed instrument combined with computer controllers and surround sound capabilities. Jim's original instrument is a combination of guitar, Chapman stick, and several other necks with varied and changeable tunings, tap hammers, sustaining pickups, and more. And in his hands, it is an incredible sound machine. He also has a conceptual design for a uh, combined uh, instrument, uh, fully modernized, uh, which would also include a touchscreen and pretty much any uh, new technology you can think of into this incredible uh, thing. It's it, it's in many ways, to me, sort of a merger of human and machine, the way uh, the, the device is put together and the way it works to create sound and the way you work it uh, to complete that process. It's, you know, almost a... And to watch Jim play it, it's almost like a, a cyborg uh, kind of experience uh, to me. So do go uh, check that out in the show notes. That's just a brief look at the modern growth of instrument building and some fresh changes underway. Like many human endeavors, when you look deep, you can easily marvel at all the science and engineering behind it, even behind artistic expressions like music. Could Bach have imagined the electric guitar? I think he would have liked it. Uh, Go listen to a huge pipe organ. It's kind of like a guitar plugged into a Marshall stack. What will musicians be playing in 200 years? Will robots sit in the orchestra side by side with their human counterparts? And that's your show for today. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Please do come visit the show online at panfuture.org. From there, you will find all the show notes and all the links. And for this show, I really highly recommend that you do that because there'll be a lot of YouTube videos and things so you can check out how all these fantastic instruments sound. Uh, It's kind of hard for me to just describe it verbally and have you really get a sense of what's going on there. Uh, Also from the panfuture.org site, you can send me an email. You can find out the, uh, find the Facebook and Twitter pages. I do quite a bit of tweeting. Uh, Lots of stuff that doesn't make it into the news segment ends up uh, being something that I retweeted from somewhere at some point doing something with things. Um, 
And yeah, I guess that's all I've got for this week. I will talk to you again in the future.